I'm Luke. I've been with Bungie my entire career, uh, 16 years, right out of Utah State. Um, I've, I've never been anywhere else. So whenever I meet somebody else, I'm like, oh, tell me about the outside world, the industry. Um, I've been in the head of engineering role since about, about a year and a half. The previous Bungie head of engineering was in the role for over 10 years. So I still, he's now our president. I still sort of feel like an imposter. So thank you for being kind. For those of you who don't know Bungie, it was founded in Chicago by uh, these, two, these two gentlemen. Um, we moved out here uh, when we were purchased by Microsoft in 2000. We became independent again in 07, and uh, we have just, just over in Bellevue, about 700 souls over there. And again, for those of you who do know us, we're most commonly known for, the, for Halo and, uh, and Destiny, even though as I walked in, someone's like, hey, Bungie, Marathon! And I'm like, oh, I should have had that up here, so I feel guilty now, so I apologize for all my old school uh, Bungie fans. You might be wondering, why is this engineer here talking about, like, why, why am I here? And, and you might be thinking, oh my gosh, like, Destiny 2 is coming out soon. I bet he's here to talk about Destiny 2. I'm not here to talk about Destiny 2. So for those of you in the back who want to walk out, that's okay. You might also think, maybe he's here to talk about some awesome new technology. Maybe he's here to talk about VR. I'm not here to talk about tech. I'm not here to talk about VR. So again, you could leave. I'll save you 20 minutes. I think there's a cool casino talk just next door. Go to that. Um, so, okay, what the hell am I here to talk about? I'm here to talk about people. I'm here to talk about engineers. I'm here to talk specifically about the, the engineering department at Bungie. I think there are going to be takeaways for anybody, not mobile space, any industry, any, any company that has engineers. I, I think it applies to anybody. I think those are valuable takeaways. I hope all of you will walk out of here being like, that was worth my, my 20 minutes. I hope so. Um, before I dive in, you'll hear me use the words management. And it's important that when you hear me say that, at most places when you hear, you know, Susie manages Billy and their engineers, that usually implies a bunch of stuff, like technical direction or they dole out tasks. Oh yeah, by the way, they do reviews. But at Bungie, when we're talking about management, I'm very specifically talking about people management. And what we mean by that is about the craft and the skill set about making other people succeed, other engineers succeed. Okay, that's a great smiley face. What the hell does that mean? I'm talking about your manager is responsible for your happiness, your engagement. How are you actually doing as a person? It, it, they're responsible for, are you getting the right feedback you need? How are you doing in your craft development as an engineer? And they're also responsible for your career planning. That's what management means at Bungie. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, we're gonna talk over like the last six games while I've been at, at Bungie, we're gonna talk about the, how the org and the department has changed over time. I think it's gonna be pretty cool. We're gonna talk about some, some takeaways. What are the takeaways? I want you to walk out of here with three takeaways. The first one is I urge all of you, any company that has engineered, to passionately care about your engineers, care about them. Also, care about people management as a craft. Don't just think about it as something that's done on the side or it's just reviews. Care about people management. And last, I want you to think deeply and care about how your engineering department is organized. It matters a lot. Those are the takeaways. Okay, so Halo 1. Oh my god, the good old days. This is when I joined. We had 14 engineers. It was a crazy sort of org. You'll notice a bunch of engineers are reporting to Jason, our co-founder. He's a, he was the lead engineer, lead designer, lead fucking everything. He's doing tons of stuff. Okay, that's sort of wacky. We have some engineers reporting to design leads. You're like, oh, that's, way, that's wacky. Okay, so what's the lesson we learned? First lesson we learned, and we've had this for now for 16 years, you need to have a consistent hiring bar and process. How do you care about your engineers? First, you need to care about who you actually bring into the department. That's how the first step about caring about your engineers. At Bungie, one philosophy we've used for 16 years is you need to hire for potential, not short-term needs. Don't be thinking about when you bring an engineer in, what is the one thing they're going to work on? You need to be thinking about three, five, ten years into the future. You should be excited about bringing that person in. You should be like, this person is an awesome hire. I want them at the company for the next 10 years. And this, right, right up there, that is, that is literally what our engineering interview process is. And, our, and, uh, and it's when I, funny when, I, when the recruiters were like, you're going to tell them what our interview process is? I'm like, yes, this is what our process is. It's pretty simple. The thing that's interesting at the bottom about the three cross-department loops, that means that we spend like three hours having our engineers interact with artists, designers, other, other people that are not engineers. Why is that? And that's because fit. Basically, are they going to get along with other people? Are they an asshole? Are they toxic? That's super important. Are they going to work well on a team? This is hard. We, over the last 16 years, you will be constantly tempted to change your bar. You will have these urgent things, business, and people will be like, we got to get this feature done. Go hire some more engineers. You'll be tempted, and I promise you, fight that temptation. Next thing, a lot of places do this differently. We believe engineers should be managed by other engineers. Some places do this differently. Okay, why? Well, we think that basically we believe that your manager to actually support you as a, as a person, they should understand your craft, they should understand what you do, your day-to-day, -day, your challenges. But again, this is hard, this is super hard. It's hard to find awesome engineers and it's also hard to find people who are really good people managers. It's hard to find both of those. So I'm saying like, <laughs> this is actually a challenge. 
but it works out really well. People actually come away, seem to be pretty happy. That's a, it's, anyway, a good lesson learned. Okay, so that takes us to Halo 2. Um, 2004, now we're up to 20 engineers. Not a big jump in the size of the department. A um, little more unified. We now actually have engineers uh, managing other engineers. Uh, we, have, uh, we actually have an engineering lead who is a full-time job. It's not Jason doing like a thousand things. Okay, that's great. Now, for those of you who don't know, maybe a bunch of people might not know, um, the last year or year and a half of closing Halo was brutal. Now, I, I usually define crunch as if you're working more than about 50 hours a week, that's crunch. The Halo 2 crunch almost killed Bungie as a company. It was the most I've ever seen human beings work in a year and a half. It was brutal. And people have actually asked us, well, what, what, what was it like? And I said, well, I found a picture online. This is what it was like. It was getting crushed by pneumatic press. Oh, I love that video. So it almost killed us. Those of us who were left, not that joke, a lot of people stayed around, um, basically vowed never again. We can never again put ourselves through that. And basically, we developed this philosophy about, about crunch. There's the crunch you want to do, and there's the crunch you have to do. The want to do can be awesome. When you find passionate people who are excited and you have cool stuff to work on, and they want to put in some extra effort, that can be really good. You got to be careful because people, if, you know, if they're super excited, before you know it, they're just working a ton, and before you know it, they're getting burned out. And you got to be careful, or they, their team develops a crunch culture, you got to be careful there. But it's the nefarious one is the crunch you have to do. That is when you were like, we have to work 60, 70, 80 hours a week to ship. That's the nefarious one. So once you have built crunch in, once your company is used to crunching, not relying on crunch to ship is now hard. Unringing that bell is very difficult. It requires changes to planning and culture. These are, takes a long, this take a long time to do. This took us years over multiple games to basically move away from the crunch philosophy. Halo 3, uh, 2007, uh, three years later, only up to 28 engineers. Interesting note, right at about this, for, for those of you who are wondering, you know, right around 28 engineers, that's when we needed a dedicated engineering recruiter, full time, that's all they were doing. It was just basically like, we had enough, enough people you know, coming, going, trying to fill slots, so we need a dedicated recruiter. Um, it was around this time that we actually found, whoa, there's this interesting phenomena. And again, lots of places do this differently, this works really well for us. What is the right ratio of the number of reports to manager? It's a fair question. What we found is that three to one or four to one is a really nice sweet spot. And the question is, well, why? Well, on one reason is that, is that man, you know, if you're, a report, if, you're a, if you're a person and your manager only has a couple of reports, you feel like they have time for you. They can support you. You can get to know them. As a manager, you feel like you're only trying to build a relationship with a couple people. But more importantly, you're like, oh, wow, and I also have time for other things like writing code or doing technology or leadership or whatever else. The sweet spot seems to work really well. The downside, what's the downside? The downside is, well, as you scale, you need more people managers. And I already told them that people managers were hard to find. So that's hard. It's also hard to absorb reports if a manager leaves. All of a sudden, you're like, ooh, this person had four reports. I need to distribute them out and move them around. It, it, it's hard. OK. It was also right around Halo 3 that we were like, man, we need to start getting serious about around people management as a craft. We were part of Microsoft at that time. Microsoft is fucking awesome about people management. They have a whole bunch of training and things. But we really started to take it seriously. And it was around this time that we developed sort of three pillars about thinking about management. And that's these awesome pictures below. That's Hope Solo in the middle. But anyway. Um, the first one is one-on-ones. One-on-ones became this bedrock of establishing an awesome relationship between a report and their, and their manager. The important thing about one-on-ones is that we tell people is, hey, this is like a regular thing, but once a week, go take a walk. You'll probably find half a bungee walking around Bellevue Park, usually every, like, right every week. What do we want a manager to ask? Two questions. First one, how are you doing? But the problem is that we're culturally programmed to basically say, I'm doing fine. So we talk a lot about happiness. How are you actually doing? How, how's it going this week? Is anything stressing you out? The second question we want managers to ask in that 101 is, what can I do for you? How, can, I, can I help you out this week? Is there anything you're blocked on? That's part of my job. And it's not a status report. If it's a status report, the manager's not doing a good enough job. The next thing is goals. Every three months, we want managers and reports to sit down and talk about, hey, let's actually talk about what are, what are all the responsibilities you're doing? What are all the hats you're wearing? What are your priorities? And expectations, what, is, what, is like, what does success look like for the next three months? Like, let's actually talk about that. Where's your time going? Are you 20% of your time is going to this thing? No, let's talk about that. And last one is performance management. Every six months, we do, uh, we do reviews. We do a performance management cycle. A big part of that, we spend a bunch of time on that. That's getting 360 feedback, making sure people are actually getting the feedback they need to grow as engineers. And we talk a lot about, um, about career paths around that time as well. OK, so now that I just told you, you should take this seriously and you should care about it. It's not free. There is no free lunch here. So we actually have these heuristics where for every, if I'm, if I'm a manager, every report that I have, it's about 10% of, of my time goes to basically just write off the books, 
towards that person. If I'm also, let's say they're right at a college and I'm actually doing some like craft development with them, that's another 10% right off the bat. So uh, if I'm ramping up a brand new engineer, 20% of my time right off the bat is just devoted to that person. And right around, if we add all those up, right around 40%, that's when I'm like, hey, are you, should you be on the critical IC path for anything? That's when we start asking those questions. We've found this to be a useful heuristic and we've stuck to it for, for years now. And yeah, this is hard, it's really hard. And you're gonna ha constantly be, have that pressure, which is like, but wait, let's just do that one more feature. Can't you just skip one-on-ones? Can't you just skip your goals for this period? And the answer is no, no, don't. It's not worth it. People and people management is more important than that one extra feature. Now we jump to Reach 2010. We're up to 42 engineers now, so it's a decent jump from, from, uh, from Halo 3. And you might be wondering, well, where's, where's that going? Well, Destiny hiring is now ramping up. And we also now have a head of engineering. We, we have reach and development, and we also have, uh, have Destiny sort of spinning up. OK, so I told you, OK, it was around Halo 3. We started getting serious about performance management and all these things. We also learned in reach, it was around this time, we're like, man, transparency, performance management transparency, and this is supposed to be a picture of a smoke-filled room, um, is important. We had a lot of feedback from people who were like, I don't, hey, I'm not so sure about the, this, this, my review or what's going on. So what we found, the lesson we learned here, is that building a system that is perceived as transparent, if you, if, just because you made something that's not intentionally opaque, it's not the same thing as making it transparent. So I told you before, every six months, we have managers who basically build a performance review. They get together and they talk about a person's, these are the top three things that went well, here's some stuff that could have gone better. And we had this crazy idea and in reach, it was like, well, wait a minute, why are we not actually building into our process, having the manager make sure that they sit down at the report before they actually meet the other managers and actually go over, here's what I'm gonna present in your performance review. It sounds like an obvious radical thing, but it worked really well because people were like, oh, I, I get it. You're gonna, you now just told me what you're gonna say about me. Okay, that makes sense. This is hard. It means there's more work up front. There's more radical candor. And my God, for anybody out there, the book Radical Candor is phenomenal. I hope everybody who reads it, who cares about people management, um, the downside here is it can take years for your, for, for your team, for people to believe there is no smoke-filled room at your company. There is no just like some big boss of the cigar who's like, that person gets a promotion. So this is hard to do. Okay, right here. Manager stability is important. We do one-on-ones. We do all these things to build this relationship between a manager and their report. Really important thing. How long does that take? It takes up to a year, we found, to really build a solid relationship between a manager and their report. And that relationship is like gold. You're gonna have stress, you're gonna have projects that are having hard times, all these things are gonna happen. But at the end of the day, if that relationship between a manager and the report is solid, that can be the thing that keeps a person from, from quitting. That can be the thing that saves them. And I, I do believe we take this very seriously. And the, and the tough part is that on paper, you'll be tempted constantly to basically move people around in the department. And each of those times you're changing management, those are actually taxes on humans. And it, it seems simple to do, but it, it's hard. It's hard to preserve them because it reduces your organizational flexibility. So, keep going. That takes us up to Destiny, and you're like, oh my god, okay, that's 124 engineers now. Uh, that, that is a totally not super useful chart, but that's what like a basically branch factor three to four looks like in an org. Um, yes, we hired 80 engineers uh, within with those four years. Our hiring philosophy was really put to the test, and that's why I actually led with it. Um, Jobs, Steve Jobs talked about this thing called the bozo explosion, which is what happens when you have rapid growth and you basically start lowering your bar, like over time it just keeps going down and down and down. I do believe that Bungie avoided the bozo explosion because we kept that hiring bar high and we were constantly tempted to basically be like, eh, let's just, and the answer was no, we, we held the bar. Um, other note here is that yes, adding 80 people was not some linear like difficulty, it's at, like at that scale, oh my God, scaling up is disproportionately more, no more work. Um, for anybody out there who's about to hire 80 engineers, um, so, lesson we learned here, okay, managing managers is a unique skill set. What the hell do I mean by that? Okay, I've just told you this importance of one-on-ones, doing reviews, and all these things about, about if you have a couple reports. When all of a sudden you have lots of people, you start having these deep orgs develop, all of a sudden it's not just about me maintaining a relationship with this one person. I need to maintain a relationship with their entire org. I need to make sure the health, how are those people actually doing in that org? Is everybody doing okay? We started instituting a policy of doing quarterly skip level reviews. That's basically making sure that you're meeting, getting face time with your, with your whole org, and also doing basically goal reviews. The manager should be actually looking at all the goals of people in the org to sort of see, how's everybody doing? Like, what, what are people working on? Yeah, this is hard. This is another thing I'm telling you this is difficult to do. 
Um, it takes a lot more work, and it's also another constraint. I already told you, and it's like, man, it's hard to hire, hire engineers who are good people managers, and also people who are good people managers who are also basically know how to manage like orgs. It's, it's tricky to do, so it's, it's even harder to hire those people. Um, lesson learned for Destiny. So this is sort of different from, from Halo 2. Work-life balance is important. That is Cannon Beach, where I just got back from uh, for my own vacation. Um, we give engineers about like 40 days off a year. I think we're pretty generous. I mean, that's like a sum total of time, PTO, holiday, all the rest of it. What we learned in Destiny was this interesting thing. Just giving people the time off isn't sufficient. A lot of people will still get burned out because they don't take the vacation. So what we found right around 2011, 2012 is your manager, part of their job is ensuring that you take a vacation. And when I say that, they basically, we periodically look over everybody how much vacation time they've had, and we're like, hey, you should probably go take some time off, or hey, what's going on? I noticed you haven't booked any time this summer. Part of a manager's job. Um, and yeah, the tricky thing here is leadership needs to set examples. I mean, and, and it can take years for the culture to develop. It can take years for people to believe that it's okay for them to take a nice vacation, that it's not some crazy crunch culture, no one's gonna, nothing bad's gonna happen when they come back from a two-week vacation in France. So, Destiny 2, uh, that takes us up to today. 115 engineers, and that is a, again, totally comedic, non-readable, uh, joke-like thing. Uh, but the cool thing is that we are now under one single org, uh, the, the, the whole engineering department. Um, everybody reports to me. So yes, I do a lot of skip-level reviews, if you're, or skip-level uh, meetings, if you're wondering. Um, this reflects that Bungie is now we're supporting a live game of Destiny. We're working on a sequel, feature R&D. You might be wondering, wow, 115, they went down a little bit from peak Destiny. Well, we also have these two awesome partner studios we're working with, Vicarious Visions and High Moon Studios, helping us out. So, yeah, please don't think like, oh, they suddenly figured a way to do all this awesome stuff with just less people. Um, lesson learned from the last couple years of Destiny 2. It turns out you can over-specialize in engineering. Now, what, you might wonder, what do I mean by that? Um, Back when we were only had, what, 14 engineers or a small number for Halo 1, most of your engineers are generalists. They touch up different parts of the code base. They do a lot of different things. The second you're up to 120 engineers, people start specializing. By Destiny 1, we had 17-ish specializations. I'm talking about AI, graphics, sandbox, matchmaking. We had investment engineers, hyper-specialized people. And in the moment, that specialization feels awesome. You are getting super good at one specific thing. It's tied to mastery, which is a really important thing for motivation. It feels great. The problem is that over time, if I just keep feeding you over like a year and a half, you're an AI person, all you're working on is AI bugs for a year and a half, eventually you're gonna get burned out and turn to low morale. So it was around 2015, we actually moved, and this isn't just our engineering department, it's all a bungee, we actually moved to an agile small team development model. It was a pretty big shift for us. Um, and we also, part of our pivot today is trying to move back towards the generalist, generalist uh, direction is we only have eight specializations today, and that's very intentional because we saw sort of what happened of, of hyper-specialization. So back to work-life balance uh, being important. Um, uh, so our last department-wide crunch that we had, the whole engineering department, was in 2013. When we shipped uh, Destiny 1, we basically used these sign-up sheets in the morning and night that engineers would sign up for to make sure we had coverage for people and, on, and for, to support the test team and everybody else. But the cool thing is Destiny 2 will actually be our fifth release. We've done DLCs and all these things with no full engineering department enforced crunch. And we're really proud of that. It took a long time to actually get us there, going back to the Halo 2 days. And to be clear, I mean, I'm talking about, we still have people right now at the back of the studio working their butts off to, to, you know, to basically close out Destiny 2. So I'm not talking about individuals who are having to work. I'm talking about full department crunch. And this was a big deal for us. So I don't know. We don't, we don't get to talk about it that often. So woohoo, that was awesome. Um, anyway, back to my takeaways. Care about your engineers. Care about people management as this important skill, this craft that you want to nurture and help your engineers, uh, especially your people managers, learn. And care about how your department is organized. Care a lot about it. It matters a lot. And that's it. Thank you all for, uh, for listening. Thank you. Appreciate it. As much as you can share the, the, the data, can you talk a little bit about the sort of funnel? I mean, Bungie is a cool place to work. You must get sort of thousands of applications, and you sort of filter through them. What percentage get through to a kind of a phone screen? Oh and from that, gosh. how many get through to a full loop? And then what percentage do you take from that full loop? As, as much as you can it share. It depends so much on the seniority of the position. I would say our associate engineers, I mean, yeah, we get a lot of, I mean, I would say, oh my gosh. And I'm looking desperately out in the audience. I'm trying to think about this right now. Um, as, far as, as far as numbers, I would say this industry, especially this area, is so competitive at the senior level. I would say those we definitely get fewer hits on, be at the associate levels. I don't, I don't know. I mean, and like I said, that process there, 
Uh, we do resume reviews, and for, especially for the associates, most of those, I actually do, I do technical phone screens for, I do a lot of technical phone screens for people. Um, what percentage get through? I, I don't want to make something up. I'd be totally out of my ass and, and off, so I don't, I don't think I will. But yeah, I'll just say this. Yeah, seniority, especially people management positions, just get rarer and rarer as far as even people coming in the door. That's how competitive it is right now. So, so going to the technical phone screens, do you just do it on the phone? Do you have a coder pad? Do you write that, get to write code? We're, we're pretty big believers in, especially on the, on, the, on the phone screen part, which is basically just like, I want to ask somebody a hard, a hard enough question that, you know, that really makes them, they can think. But yeah, these are actually just on the phone, two questions. We do the same ones we've been using it for, for years. Um, Pretty, pretty standard, because yeah, and part of the whole goal is you want consistency over time, right? You want to ask people the same questions over years so you can actually develop a grading scheme. Like, for all of our questions, we have a pretty decent A through F grading scheme that we want to be able to say, like, if I get hit by a bus, I want another people manager to come in and be able to take those questions and apply it. So we really try to focus on consistency, try to eliminate bias, stuff like that as well, because that's another important thing, so. Okay. Yeah, hi, uh, really good talk. Um, so I wondered, because with Destiny and Destiny 2, you. It's not, obviously Halo had a big online component, but this is more like a service-based game, and I wondered if that had had an impact on how easy or hard it was to manage crunch at the company. Oh my gosh, yeah, I, I, would definitely, I would definitely say that, that yeah, for us, we uh, moving from the, the Reach engine, which we had built several games on the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the actual Halo engine, Reach was the last one, yeah, we that basically moved from Reach Engine to the Destiny Engine. Like we couldn't have shipped, we couldn't have shipped uh, on the PS the PS3 using the, the Reach Engine. Um, I would say the crunch was a lot of it was as I said, it's not just it wasn't just engineer. It really was you need buy in from everybody because you will have people. I mean, we have some amazing designers who are like, this feature is going to be amazing and it's going to be this, and you're like. It's over by four months. It's not going to fit, and they're like, no, come on. And and, and the problem is that. Halo 2, I was the person who was like, let's go build it. And before you know it, I'm here every day for until, you know, four in the morning. And, you know, I never, never seen my wife. And, yeah, I mean, it was, it was bad. So, yeah, how much of it was actually the type of game? I would say building a new engine was definitely, was definitely hard. But I think, I do think a majority of it is actually more, you will always have enough awesome ideas of things you want to build, always. And you always have to have that sort of, that rigor to be like, no, like, we can't do that. And that's okay. Because the second you have somebody who's like, oh, you guys are lazy over there in engineering, the whole thing falls apart. So, yeah. so another question. You care about your sort of people. So there's a lot of inter human interaction sort of going day to day. But you also care about work-life balance. Yeah. What percentage of time does a bunch engineer work from home and telecommute as opposed to being in the office? Because I can see benefits of both sides. That's, it's a great question. Well, what we actually found was, man, we have, we've tried different at different moments. We've tried basically trying to set up sort of work from home situations. The hard thing is, we actually have, based on our, our small team, our small team models, like what we found is that, like, you know, when you, so much of it is trying to, you know, we, we basically have core hours from 10 to 4, and we really, it is very important to be there present with your team. You have a tester right there who's working on something or, or whatever else. So we actually found that for a whole bunch of our, mo most of our engineering positions right now, yeah, most of those we really are, we don't, like, we don't have any full-time people who are doing, like, work from home or anything like that. So it is very much a, you know, <laughs> bungee, bungee, come work. It's a pretty traditional setup in that way. Okay, so I'm currently in, uh, just lo looking for a job, and so I've been applying to however many, many places, a few hundred uh, online, but I've heard that a lot of places don't necessarily throw out, but don't really look at a resume that was given to them online versus through the networking. Um, so I was curious what the percentage would be back and forth, um, online applicants that you interview versus somebody that's met through the network. Oh yeah, for, I mean, we have a pretty traditional pipeline for online, and I, I promise you, like, we do, we do look at them and they don't get weeded out. I mean, the, like, we, a lot of it is basically, and, I, and again, I, I, wish, I wish our recruiters were up here who could do a better job explaining you that, but, but yeah, no, I mean, like, we, we don't have some hidden backdoor thing that discards a whole bunch of the online ones. Like, when I say go to, you know, it's, it's basically go to, go to Bungie and go to our career page, like, that when you say submit, you know, <laughs> submit my application, I mean, that's it's it's the same pipeline you'd go through if we called you. So it's it, it, yeah, we, we don't have any sort of front door weed stuff out or anything like that. So we have a whole group of recruiters, and then also then the hiring managers who review a whole bunch of <laughs> a whole bunch of these things as they come in. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, big round of applause for Salute. Thank you very much. Thank you guys.